Hi, I'm Monica McCain. This program is designed to bring issues about the community board and our neighborhood to you, the public. Community boards are agencies of the city. They're staffed by volunteers. We air issues that are important to the city and the neighborhood and help advise government into what needs the community has. We have a website www.cb8m.com, which gives information about the community board, our meetings, and has a calendar. We have this program, which is every month we talk about different issues related to community board. And tonight's program is actually about the needs of food security in the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island. What is food security? Food security is having, um, not being, in, being afraid of being hungry or starving. And you may think, well, that's pretty strange for such an affluent area. It's one of the most affluent areas in the world. But there is a need in the, in the Upper East Side. And there are people who are in, in great peril. Um, we have some guests tonight who are, are going to help us with that. But first, one thing that has, you may have seen this issue of Our Town, which was early December 2008, which brought about a story about the, uh, the challenges of food pantries and their increasing demands and the reduced resources, they provide food to people who are in need. Our guests tonight include Barbara Rutter, who is the co-chair of the Health Seniors and Social Services Committee of Community Board 8, and Jamie Manson, who is the Social Justice Director for the Jan Hus Presbyterian Church and Neighborhood House, which is on East 74th Street. So thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Barbara, we'll get started with you. Could you t describe a little bit about what the Health Seniors and Social Sur Services Committee um, does and what you hear in your meetings? The Health Seniors and Social Services, we call it the HESS Committee because of the initials, is fairly new again. It, it was in existence years back and has been reinstated in about for about a year. We do not hold meetings every month, so we've so far tackled a couple, just a couple of different issues. One of the big issues that we, we tackled what dealt with seniors. We knew that the Department for the Aging, DIFTA, was proposing some major changes that would have a major impact on the seniors, and we have a very large senior population in our community board. And we studied the proposals and came out with resolutions um, to instruct the city the changes that we thought were beneficial. The other study that we've been doing recently has been about the homeless. We've noticed that there has been an increase in the homeless in our community board. As affluent as our area is, it's, it's heartbreaking to see the number of people that are living on our streets. And so we have studied what is happening. It, in fact, have there been an increase? Um, we did have a drop-in center in our neighborhood on East 77th Street that has closed. We talked about what the effect that had. And what we will be discussing at our next meeting as some of the RFPs that the city has put out that will have a major effect on not only um, the, um, the, the drop-in center, but also on the faith base, the synagogues, the churches that have in fact been providing services to the homeless. And we will be doing a study and hopefully come back with some resolutions to tell our hope for for a better solution than what is happening right now. Jamie, could you describe a little bit about Jan Hus Community Center and the church? What are you involved with and what are the services you provide? Uh, the program is church-based. Um, it, uh, it is called the Homeless Outreach and Advocacy Program. It started in 1990 and it has grown over what is nearly 20 years now. Uh, it started as a small church-based outreach program, uh, and I would say in the last six years has become larger and larger. Uh, we provide an incredible continuum of services, especially for a church-based program and such a small program. Um, one of the most important things that we do is we offer our mailing address uh, to over 500 clients. A mailing address is so critically important. Um, it allows people to receive their benefits checks. It allows them to open up checking accounts. It allows them to be in touch with family members. Uh, so now we, we have become nearly a post office, uh, taking in the mail for 500 people. Yeah, Barbara and I came to visit your center and people were coming in saying, is my mail here, is my mail here? It was amazing. Yes, yeah, that was one of our largest services. Uh, but there's also many others. We have uh, two computers, we have a phone that we allow our clients to use. They get. Um, 
uh, internet access. They're able to open up an email account. That helps a lot of them find work. Um, we offer supportive counseling. Uh, we try to foster a community environment uh, at the program because so many uh, agencies that our clients have to go to are um, personally uh, corrosive. Uh, they can be very degrading experiences. Hours and hours of waits online, getting the runaround. And we really try to foster something quite different, so a communal environment. And by and large, we've been very successful with that. Uh, we also offer toiletry kits. We offer socks and underwear, which are so critically important. Uh, we have a storage facility for 40 clients, uh, the chronically homeless, who, if they're trying to look for work, need to store their things somewhere because they can't bring all of their worldly possessions to work. Um, we also have a food pantry. We have two kinds of food pantries. Uh, we have one for people who have cooking facilities and one for people who don't have cooking facilities. So that would be the street homeless. That's a unique thing, having a food access available for those without cooking facilities. We have a Tuesday night soup kitchen. Um, and we also, from time to time, offer anti-eviction assistance, utilities assistance, and emergency financial assistance, especially for people who need a birth certificate or identification. Um, those are the key services that we provide uh, at, the, at the program. Um, have you seen any change in the number of people, the type of people who are coming to Yanhus for assistance? Absolutely. Um, I started working as the director in uh, the middle of June. Uh, my second day of work, the city closed the Neighborhood Coalition for Shelter. Um, so when I was in the hiring process, uh, I was told we would see about 15 clients a day. Uh, on my first day of work, we saw 60. Tell you, Na National Coalition for Neighborhood Coalition, Neighborhood for Coalition which mm -hmm. I had never heard about mm -hmm. until Barbara and I came to visit your right. facility, yes. um, was on East 77th Street. Correct. Barbara, you had mm -hmm. hearings that where this mm -hmm. topic came up was very mm -hmm. uh, controversial, apparently, yeah. too. Um, now, there have uh, been budget cuts have just been um, announced by the city. Now, your funding does not come from the city, but will that impact you in any way? Uh, it will impact us greatly. Uh, we get some uh, small amount of funding from the city, um, but not enough that if it were withdrawn, we would be impacted. However, by the city pulling back, which it already has, in closing the Neighborhood Coalition for Shelter, that was a very big cut in city services. That's what created the tripling of numbers of our daily client visitations. Um, we will be deeply impacted because we'll get even more people because as services get cut back, people are become more and more desperate and uh, they will come to our program. Um, we do have a commitment to always keep our doors open. Um, I'm not sure what that's going to look like, though, uh, given, given what's being um, forecast in terms of budget cuts, in terms of these layoffs that we're seeing uh, that the mayor announced. Um, I'm not sure. Our services may have to change. But we have a commitment because we believe it is a moral imperative to care for people and to keep our doors open uh, to serve this community, to serve our, they are our neighbors. Where does your funding come from? The majority of our funding right now actually comes from area churches. Um, a lot of, uh, especially mainline Protestant churches, have what's called a benevolence fund. And so they give a certain amount of their money away to organi community-based organizations like the Jan Hus program. So right now the bulk of our money is coming from uh, uh, Upper East Side churches. Um, we also get some money from the United Way uh, and um, again, a small amount of money from city agencies. Uh, where does the food come from for the food pantries? Uh, most of that is purchased through our United Way grant. Um, the problem is now that our food pantry ha is suffering from a perfect storm of um, several uh, crises. Uh, the first crisis was with the food bank, uh, which has dwindling funds, and so the amount of food they're giving us has been cut back. Then we had the skyrocketing cost of food. So the money that we had to purchase, we're not getting nearly as much food for that amount of money. Um, the third crisis was this tripling of the number of visitations that we're seeing from clients. Um, all of that together has caused, I had to close the pantry actually in November uh, because we ran out of our funding uh, for the food pantry. Um, luckily through the generosity of uh, several members of Community Board 8 who ran uh, food drives in their uh, co-op buildings, we were able to reopen the pantry for Thanksgiving and then through Christmas. And if they had, if not for their generosity, we would have had to turn away probably six to 700 people, turn them away hungry uh, throughout the whole holiday season. Well, that leads to my next question about yeah. how many people do you serve uh, with your programs? Uh, how many people come in during the day? Mm -hmm. How many people need food? How many, mm -hmm. um, 
come in for um, various um, uh, services. We see an average right now 45 people a day. Um, some days we see more recently um, because we got some clothing donations in. Uh, that's one of also one of our major um, commitments is we actually do a daily clothing distribution. That's a singular thing I think among outreach programs. Most outreach programs do clothing distribution maybe once a week, maybe once a month. Um, because uh, we did get a large clothing donation, we were seeing 70 to 80 people a day recently. Um, in terms of the food pantry, we're seeing greater and greater numbers every day. I would say at this point we're serving about 400 people a month. We're no longer able to give a month's worth of food in the package. We can really only give an emergency package. So the food that we're giving out probably can feed someone or a very small family or a couple maybe for five days. Uh, we used to be able to give out a monthly food package. We're not able to do that right now because of this tripling of numbers, because our funding is, uh, is, is so scarce. Can you describe the staff that you have? Uh, when we were there, we saw um, you had some people who are volunteers, mm -hmm. who are paid staff. Could you describe for the audience um, who, who helps you run this organization? Sure. We have a very small, very passionate, dedicated staff. And not if, if, if not for them, and the fact that their work, our work, is, is rooted in love and rooted in a commitment to restore the dignity of all those who come to our doors, we would not be able to do what we do. Uh, there's me, I'm the director. Uh, we recently had to create a position of a social worker, a uh, full-time social worker, because we had such an influx of people with such an increasing complexity of need. We had to have someone with social service expertise. Um, that was another great um, challenge of the Neighborhood Coalition for Shelter Closing, they had a core group of social workers. So that whole service, that whole social service component fell out from, from the Upper East Side. Uh, we also have a full-time intern. And uh, then we have um, two students who are at Union Seminary um, who work with us through a federal work study program. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So that's, that's the core staff. But um, I, I have to say, for such a small staff, that dedication, I mean, they make, we make miracles happen every day. When Barbara and I were visiting, we went yeah. downstairs where the, you have the tote bins that have the, um, mm -hmm. the belongings of the homeless people who uh, you know, are out looking for work or are working and they need yeah. a place to store everything. Right. There were a couple of fellows working down there. Yes. One of them said you were the greatest director they've ever had. <laughs> um, and uh, Now, what is, their, what is their role? Are they volunteers or part-time workers? Uh, they are actually uh, a new program that we started um, over the summer. Um, they are formerly homeless men. And um, they are men who are working, walking the path of sobriety. Uh, they are men who are trying to get into housing. They're trying to rehabilitate their lives. And so we give um, men like this an opportunity to have a job with a small stipend. And they help us uh, with some of the more critical things that we need, like clothes, clothes sorting, picking up donations, um, just general support of the program. So right now, we have two men who are working with us. Uh, they're wonderful. They keep our spirits high. They also give us a real um, insight into uh, homelessness and what it's like to recover from homelessness. There's not a safe, a good safety net for men like that who finally get sober, who are trying to get back into the workforce, uh, who are trying to um, find work. Um, and we, we have many clients who come to our program who are working and can't afford housing. We have a lot of people living on the streets and who are working. There were also, when you talked about the clothing, there were, yeah. you said there, there are two clothing areas when we visited. There's one for the business clothing, That's one right. for regular clothing. Could you describe that a little bit? Sure. Because we, we, sure. we took <laughs> some pictures. We didn't arrange yeah. to show them. But uh, can you <laughs> describe for the audience what they look like, the, the rooms themselves, and how they're organized? Absolutely. One of the benefits of being on the Upper East Side is we get some pretty fantastic clothing. Um, we've nicknamed our clothing room uh, Bloomingdale's North <laughs> uh, because we do get some really beautiful clothes. Um, and what we do is we sort them out um, for the professional clothing, uh, men's, men's slacks, men's uh, dress shirts. Shirts, uh, men's ties, uh, things like that, jackets, suits, women's skirts, uh, for those who come to us who are in need, who are trying to find work and need to dress professionally. We also have shoes. And then we have our other clothing room, which has uh, clothing that usually um, the street homeless need, jeans, hooded sweatshirts. Uh, we're always, always uh, running a scarcity of men's clothes because the majority of our clients are male. Um, and there is such a need for men's clothing. 
Uh, so we have uh, on either side of the church sanctuary, there's, there's a back room where I guess many years ago the priest would get dressed. Uh, and when Jan Hus had his playhouse theater, that would be the, the wings where the uh, actors would get dressed. Uh, and we've converted those into our little clothing rooms. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've worked out well and it gives, um, gives the opportunity for the clients to walk through the church also, which is a really serene, peaceful space that most of our clients never ever get the opportunity to be in. Um, it's important to note that uh, our services are in no way contingent on religious belief. Um, we do not proselytize in our program. It is a church-based program, but it's completely self-supporting. Um, and so there's no link between one's faith conviction and the opportunity for services. We serve anyone that comes to our doors, and we do not um, speak in any way about religion. Uh, for us, um, the ministry is just in restoring the dignity of that person giving them a sense of wholeness, giving them a sense of their own goodness as human beings. That's, that's, that's the conviction that we work on. Barbara, um, your committee talks about a lot of issues related to these. Um, are you aware of other support services in Committee Board 8 that are similar to the Yonhus program? I am not. There are church-based facilities that help. And one of our worries is they may be compromised. Uh, as, as I mentioned, there are RFPs out that have, stipul that have stipulations associated with it that may eliminate some of the, the uh, faith-based programs that work with volunteers. And uh, that is a concern of mine and my committees, and we will study and, and see what needs to be done. But I don't think there is another program that is like Yonhus, and we did have a drop-in center that has since been closed, so that facility has now been removed. Well, do you think, um, here's, a, here's a question, we, sometimes we talk about what we're going to cover, but do you, do you think that um, the profile of your program or any of these support programs needs to be raised? Because I know I consider myself a concerned citizen. I, I never heard of these things. What, do you think this type of, um, uh, some kind of, uh, um, it's, it's something with the neighborhood doesn't try to find out about these things, or, or what, do you, what do you attribute to the obscurity of, of these programs to be? Uh, I think uh, the Jan Hus program was more obscure because of the Neighborhood Coalition for Shelter. Mm -hmm. I mean, that really was the key provider of services to these populations, the poor and the homeless. Um, and so uh, the Jan Hus program sort of flew under the radar screen and was um, just a support in that in uh, the Neighborhood Coalition for Shelters continuum of services. When uh, NCS, as it's known, closed, we became the key provider. We've become the default NCS, and we were not prepared financially or in terms of staff or in terms of space to accommodate that many people. And again, it's just because um, we feel a moral imperative to care for these people that are being abandoned uh, by city services, that we continue our work. It's just, it's just our passion and our, that we're rooted in love in doing that. Um, but I think that's why we have been more obscure, and I think that's why we do need to raise our profile. Uh, we've had very good relationships with our neighbors um, in the past few years, as far as I understand it. And we work very hard to be good neighbors. Um, but we do now more than ever need the support of our community. Um, not, not only through monetary donations, but through food donations, through clothing donations, through undergarments. I can't tell you how important socks and underwear are to our clients. Something so basic as soap and shampoo changes lives every day. Well, you brought up uh, something I wanted to ask. Yeah. How can somebody make a donation to your organization? Mm -hmm. What do you need, and, and how do they go about doing that? Uh, we are... Um, in, always in need of, always, every organization is in need of financial funding, obviously. We need that to pay, especially to pay our staff salaries, again, because we are staff uh, self-supporting. Um, the Jan Hus Church that we're based out of is a very, very small community, and it's in the process of rebuilding, but that process will take a while. So many people are under the impression we have this large, wealthy, Upper East Side congregation supporting us, and that's simply not the case. We are self-supporting. Um, so we always need financial contributions, um, and that can just be, you know, you can look us up on the internet at uh, yanhoos.org and uh, you could send it to my attention. Uh, but even more than that, if people aren't able to make a financial contribution, there's a huge impact in, in donating um, non-perishable food items. Uh, 
uh, new socks, new underwear, uh, any kind of toiletries. If you go to a hotel and you see those little toiletries in the hotel room, take them. We can always use them. They make a tremendous impact on the lives of, of the individuals who come to our doors. Um, even office equipment, old office equipment, we can always use that too. Uh, and in order to donate um, physical items, uh, you can come to our neighborhood house um, anytime. We're open it from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., Monday through Friday, uh, and you can leave your donations with the receptionist. Our program is open from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., and I always strongly encourage people to come during that time because you get to see uh, our work in action. And I think people will be very, very moved. And it's an opportunity to relate to the homeless in a way that probably most people from New York City wouldn't expect. I think people will be very surprised by the communal atmosphere, the, the friendship that we form, uh, the warmth of the exchanges that we have with one another. Um, we are always in need of volunteers to assist us um, with sorting items, with uh, uh, st stocking the food pantry, even with working now and then with clients, helping them go to their storage. They just need to be accompanied through the building. Uh, that's a great opportunity to engage the homeless in a really human way and I think in a really eye-opening way. Barbara, when we went to visit, um, I was amazed at the operation. What were your impressions of the I operation? was just blown away and I was just so pleased. And I'd like to go back to one thing where I see the role of the community board. I see the role of the community board in this committee as being a way of bringing problems to the forefront of the community and also to bring some solutions to the forefront and, and to argue whether there are some pluses and minuses along the way. The meetings are open. You will get different points of view. But I don't think that the homeless has been in the forefront of most of our minds. And I'm hoping that the community board through this committee will make it more aware of, of the situation of what's happening. But I was not aware of Young House either. And I was just so impressed with it and hope to volunteer. Um, I also, um, you know, I, I know that you need all kinds of donations. I was amazed when you say just those little things from mm -hmm. hotel yeah, rooms. So absolutely. you have bins, you have ways to organize it, because usually yeah. people will think, you know, it's, you know, it's in insignificant, mm -hmm. but any little thing helps. Tremendous. Um, and we went to, down to the, where the, um, the pantry area was for the, the um, people of homes where you have to prepare food. Yes. And you, you'd mentioned, you were a little short on protein. Yes. Well, you know, always think of cans of tuna as being yes. a, a protein. That tends to be a little expensive, but even beans. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned it's a good source of protein. A fantastic source. Right. Yeah, and we're always in need of beans. We're always, that's probably our most critical shortage now is our food pantry. That's where we're in most need of support, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. And I can't tell you the impact that that has. And we even, we have people coming as far as the Bronx, Staten Island, for our food pantry. That's how desperate people are for food uh, in our city. Um, food security is at really a grave level and um, yeah and it's unfortunate we can't offer more uh, but we do offer we distribute food every day whereas most um, pantries distribute food once a month and in that case they're able to have a larger choice and there's a client choice but there's also a lot of limitations uh, mm -hmm. based on who can come to those programs we try to welcome everybody who comes uh, we try very hard not to be an obstacle between people and food um, and so uh, it's a unique program in the way in which we distribute, uh, but it's, it, it also means that you know, we go through food rather quickly. Um, so we're always, that's our, that's our greatest need right now is definitely uh, non-perishable food items. We're coming um, kind of closely, and we only have a couple of minutes. Barbara, could you talk briefly about how you got involved with the, um, the um, Seniors Committee and Community Board? There was discussion of the community board about whether we need a separate committee for seniors is really how it got started. And I thought we did. I think that the transportation committee, the housing committee, it doesn't deal specifically with seniors. And I felt it did. And then it grew from there where discussion on the community board said that we also would need other services also. The health part, for instance, we haven't done this yet, but I'm hoping to have a meeting about what are the health services. We have so many health institutions in our area. What services do they have for both seniors and non-seniors and how they help our community? And I was asked to be chairperson. I was honored to do it, co-chair. I have a co-chair, Ellen Pollaby is my co-chairperson. And Jamie, how did yes. you come to be social justice minister at Yacht House? Uh, it was a bit of a, a, a long and winding road. I started out, I have a Master of Divinity, um, which is a ministry degree, but I'm a Catholic, and I, the Catholic Church doesn't ordain women. But I always felt very called to ministry. Um, 
I started actually as an editor and a writer uh, at Yale University. Uh, that's where my degree is from. And I uh, always felt that there was something lacking. I loved my work, but it felt like there was something lacking. And um, left Yale after five years and pursued work at another homeless outreach program at a Catholic church, a Jesuit parish um, in the West Village. And uh, after being there for two years, I was doing all sorts of ministry uh, with a variety of types of people, but really fell in love with working with the poor. It was really, for me, uh, a very um, profound experience, a very authentic experience of ministry. And um, when the job came up at Jan Hus, uh, the opportunity to be a director and to really envision a new program um, uh, just called out to me. And uh, I, I'm as happy as I've ever been uh, in my work because I, I, I like very much being in the trenches. And uh, again, it's that authenticity, that encounter that you have with people that for me is a deeply spiritual experience. Uh, in addition to seeing, uh, you get a lot of uh, instant gratification and in seeing the impact you're making on people's lives. Um, and so I feel like it's just been sort of a calling and a journey and uh, uh, to really encounter uh, a deeply spiritual reality uh, among very broken people. So. Well, the, the atmosphere at Jan Hus that we saw um, is very warm, very yeah. uh, welcoming, yeah. and the people who came through there seemed very happy. Yeah. Um, and very, uh, you know, it, was, it seemed like something that really helped them um, become uh, well whole. And, uh, yeah, and there's a gratitude that you encounter among this population that, you, that I have never encountered among any other population. Well, again, um, I, I hope everyone will be able to um, find out more about your organization, yeah. make a donation. So um, your website is yanhus.org. Yes. J-A-N-H-U-S <laughs> dot O-R-G. Or, yes. or like me, you have no memory for those types of things, and you're fumbling around for a pen, you can just Google right. Yanhus, J-A-N-H-U-S, yes. um, and your church comes right up. Yeah. And uh, Barbara, um, you're in the community board 8, is uh, calendar is cb8m.org, your uh, dot com. Uh, your next meeting is going to be in February 19th. February 19th. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks everybody. Um, Thank you. I really appreciate this. It was a very, very um, uh, gratifying program. And uh, I know that I'm going to be making more donations. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, so thanks everyone for being on this program. And uh, I hope to you'll help Jan Hus and come to a community board meeting too. Thanks. <laughs>